discuss uh, some of the background of the wall, and we'll just start going through some of the some of the folks. And I'll give you a little idea too of how I kind of present it to the youngsters and some of the people, so you also know the twist. Apoko Karanyane is uh, from the northern part of Ghana, uh, which is called Bolgatenga, uh, from a village called Bukeri, which is now inside Bolgatenga. She's she's well known for. Uh, struggling against the slave raiders. So when they came, the head trader, she used that pestle that you see in her hand to actually kill the, the chief of that group. So once she was able to kill him, uh, that place became known as a place not to go for look for slaves. So she's like a, she's like a hero in her area uh, because she made it hard for them to come get the cargo. Uh, Queen T, this is where I tell the children about ancient Africa, ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. Uh, this is where I introduce to them the fact that we know now for sure that the, the civilization of ancient Egypt, of course, was an African civilization. Queen T being one of the most influential queens during the 18th dynasty. I tell them a little bit more about, you know, Akhenaten, which we'll meet down, down there. But this is really my introduction to them to let them know Egypt was an African civilization with Queen T. Marcus Garvey, as you see, I have him in the center here because I'm trying to uh, uh, let the youngsters know that there was an idea that if we can build Africa to be a powerful place, then a lot of the options that they think they don't have, they will have. And I tell them about the UNIA being the largest black organization in history and some of the other things like that. So that's Garvey. Most of them will not have heard of Garvey, but of course we're in Ghana, so all of them will, will have heard of Nkrumah. Uh, so I don't have to say too much about Nkrumah to them because they know some about, so I do say some things. But the important thing here is I have them realize that Nkrumah studied all of these European philosophers and great minds, Marx, Lenin, and the rest. But at the end of the day, uh, he said the one that, that had the most impact on him was Marcus Garvey's philosophies and opinions. And what that does is that puts Garvey in some kind of context because Krum is a great man referencing another great man and then the people tend to be a little more receptive when we talk about Garvey and Garveyism. So things like the Black Star Line that's, you know, here in Ghana, the Black Stars. You see they have a, a new a car that's being built in Ghana now called Kantanga. You see it's got the Black Star. All of those things, that all came from the mind of Marcus Garvey and brought by Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. uh, where we're at, the place we're at is actually called New Ningo. So the founders of New Ningo are Jonas Karbu and uh, the first chief being Take Jangma the first. So most of the youngsters are from around this area, not necessarily New Ningo, but I just want to give attention and respect to the founders of the area. As I mentioned, when we were coming in, uh, we say Leazare, once again, of Popocanyane, where she's from, and her language, which is Gruni, uh, they say uh, Leazare for welcome. I try to give some representation to different parts of the black world here. Uh, of course, Ghana, Ethiopia, uh, Jamaica, and of course, our red, black, and green, which I explained to the children about. Uh, the land, the people, and the blood. Which one is this one? Ethiopia? Ethiopia. Actually, I think, well, I won't say, I think they, they're supposed to be green at the top, so somebody just put it back up there. I think we got it. But yeah, that's Ethiopia. All right. One day I keep saying I'm going to have a, a big village scene here but uh, that day hasn't quite arrived. I even think about putting, I have all kinds of ideas what I can do with this wall here, uh, including, of course, more, more portraits. Yeah. It's beautiful. I love that. Okay. I was mentioning a little bit earlier, I was mentioning a little bit earlier some children, students I had here last, the week before last, actually, I had three groups of students two weeks ago. Um, and every time I get to this, start with this one on the stretch of the wall, Eve, and I show her as a black woman, you know, that always gets a lot of raised eyebrows and a lot of people, you know, don't particularly care for that. And I was mentioning before, 
the, the missionary who was bringing them, he really didn't like it. But, you know, it's pretty easy to explain. The main point I like to get across to them, other than the fact that humanity, our species, started on the African continent, the other thing I like to get across is that no one left the African country, continent until about 70,000 years ago. So for the first, say, 130,000 years, there were no human beings on the earth who were not on the African continent. So for two-thirds of human history, there was no one else. So when we look at our diversity and all of the things that we have, that's part of the reason we've been here a long, long time. And then, of course, we end up talking about how the whites became white if they started this way. And then we can talk all about, you know, the natural adaptations and melanin and, and so vitamin D and all of these wonderful things. And so that's why we like to have Eve. Plus, all of their literature has all of these Adam and Eve from God knows where. Then we, then we talk about Chinua Achebe. Uh, most of the children, as they grow older, at least go to college or maybe even through high school, have to read Things Fall Apart, which is a, a standard across, you know, literature courses everywhere in the world, actually. Uh, an Igbo man from Nigeria, uh, so I tell him a little bit about some of the different books that he's written, Man of the People and uh, Ant Hills of the Savannah, and just how clear his uh, imagery is when you're reading him, getting to know about the colonial times, post-colonial times, and even the behavior of our leadership and polity today. Asa Hilliard, some of y'all, anybody coming from Atlanta or around, remember Bob Asa Hilliard, who used, he's a psychologist by training, but a historian, Egyptologist, and all the rest. Uh, from, <coughs> he's originally from Texas, but um, he was also here in, in stool here in Ghana. So. Uh, if you haven't seen any videos or read much by Asa Hilliard, uh, do yourself a favor. You'll enjoy learning more about one of our great historians. Ya yeah, Santua, when you go to, are you going to Kumasi? Uh, yes. When you go to Kumasi, you'll learn more about her, the Queen Mother from Ejisu, which is one of the, uh, she was one of the ones, of course, leading the war and the struggle against the British during the colonial uh, times or the transitioning to colonialism. Didang, Didang Kamathi of the so-called Mau Mau. I think a lot of you all remember people say Mau Mau is a kind of a derogatory term. Uh, but it was really the Kikuyu or the Kenyan Land Freedom Army, where they basically had to struggle against the British. And the British, uh, or settler colonialism, where they have a whole lot of British taking a whole lot of the best land and having worse than an apartheid state. They had terrorized the African people there in Kenya uh, it wasn't a friendly takeover to take all of these best uh, lands and all. Uh, since they didn't have the armies and everything organized, they had to fight them from the bush, and Dedan Kamathi was the leader of that uh, land freedom army. Now, most Ghanaians uh, have heard that Jerry Rawlings, the former president of Ghana, his uh, son is Kimathi, and so this is the Kimathi that the ex president named him after, so that gets the attention of the young people and the teachers alike. <laughs> Uh, in Zynga, uh, Mbande of uh, Angola, and we're going back another 500 years or so. So um, we are able to kind of put her in some context with Ya Santa while all those hers was anti-colonial struggle, whereas Zynga was during the anti-slave, uh, the original slave trade times. And so we mm -hmm. talked about her diplomacy, her resistance all the way to be an older woman, and all of those kind of things with the children. Uh, Ajete was one of the uh, the, the heroes here in Ghana because when they fought against, uh, when the, the West African regiments fought with the British side during World War II, they were all distinguished for fighting in Burma and basically uh, taking over, putting out the Japanese and that kind of thing. So when they went to get their due, that's their retirements, pensions, money and all, the British reneged. And so they marched, he was shot along with two others and that sparked the Accra riots here in Ghana. And that's when they jailed and crewmen some of the rest of them. And that's really when the colonial order began to really unravel here in Ghana. So he's one of the people who lit the match. Uh, Maurice Bishop, of course, this is where I get to talk about why black people are in the Caribbean, which, you know, most of these students really don't know how we got to the Caribbean. They just think, you know, I don't know what they think. So we have to talk a little bit about how the slave trade got the Caribbean islands. 
primarily black. I tell him about Maurice Bishop, the New Jewel Movement, you know, where he had done all of these things. So all of the metrics you look at in terms of a civilized, organized society, in terms of education, healthcare, and the rest, he had brought all those metrics up. And unfortunately, uh, as a lot of you may remember, in 83, of the United States destroyed that nation in that small revolution. Maurice wow. Bishop was killed right around, right in that time period. And uh, we lost that momentum. But you know, I think, I always say the last thing they felt that they could afford was a black Castro in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Namaton Amazon Warriors. Uh, the homie is Benin. So these are the sisters. If you read some of the French uh, accounts about these very courageous African women mm -hmm. uh, being out in the front during the fighting, you'll find um, them talking about these warriors in support of Bahanza. And of course, they were all fighting against the French, trying to maintain their freedom. And I think one time uh, when Bomani was here, someone in his group mentioned that they were the ones that they modeled the uh, women in the Black Panther movie, mm -hmm. modeled after that. Uh, Edward Wilmot Blyden, who was one of the true fathers of Pan-Africanism, uh, born in St. Thomas, which is in the Virgin Islands. Uh, but he made his biggest mark in Liberia, where he was uh, not just a, a scholar, but a, a politician, an ambassador, and of course, a writer. Uh, Islam, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race, probably the best known of his writing. But you know, you can go back, and he's written book, Africa for the Africans. You know, these kind of things. And this was before Garvey had popularized, popularized it. So we give him credit for being one of the fathers of the Pan-Africanism we claim today. Steve Biko, this is probably one of the more painful ones because almost no matter the size of the group, the students and even some of the teachers, I ask, does anyone here know what apartheid is? The students almost never know. But they can tell you a whole lot about British history, a whole lot about the Celts, whole lot about the Roman army and what they were, all of that, but they can't tell you about apartheid here in Africa. So then we have to explain what apartheid was and where Steve Biko, being an anti-apartheid advocate, writer, thinker, and was eventually murdered for his, for his thinking. So we have a lot to do and a lot of catching up to do with just a lot of the basics with the students. But they get it very quickly, but somewhere they have to be exposed to it. Sony Ali, that's when we tell them about the Ghana, Mali, and Songhai empires. Uh, uh, Sony Ali being the the leader of the largest empire, the Songhai Empire. So now another thing we do is we have the children. I can show you videos that actually act out these things in our program. So I'll write a long script. They'll remember the script, and then they'll say, "I'm Sony Ali," and then they'll act it out. So we've done that for a lot of these on the wall, and uh, I'm collecting those, and I'm going to put them all together on some kind of YouTube channel or something, so other people, parents have access to. I mentioned the struggle in, in Benin or Dahomey against the French. He was the King Shark, who was, uh, you know, the leader of that. And I mentioned the, his frontline troops, some of them at, at least be in the Amazon, Nomaton women. Mary Makiba, after I've explained to them something about apartheid, then I can tell about how she was an anti-apartheid activist across the, across the world. Of course, she was kicked out of her own country, sent into exile for some three decades, for the same reason. Uh, they didn't like her political stance and using her talent uh, to push the anti-apartheid uh, program. Jake Anta Jup, of course, uh, a lot of people in the African Center community have really been getting into uh, Jake Anta Jup in the last 30 years. More than anyone, he and Theo Theophil Obenga have demonstrated the Africanness of uh, ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. Uh, some of you may have seen some of the minutes from the 1974 uh, UNESCO uh, conference on peopling of Egypt where uh, Sheikh Anta and, and Obenga just shut them down. So he's a historian, uh, scientist, uh, chemist, and all of the rest, but also a very, very astute political thinker. One of the most important books he's written is uh, Black Africa, uh, the Cultural Economic Basis for a Federated State, which I think today is still one of the most powerful small books in terms of what to do in Africa that I've seen out there. J.J. Dessalines, of course, they, they all know about Napoleon, so it's easy to uh, put this guy in context, how he and, uh, and of course, Toussaint Louverture were able to uh, beat Napoleon's army. And so the children know then, okay, so Napoleon's army, which they forced us to learn about in Ghana schools, 
had this African who was able to beat them, uh, kick them off the island of Haiti, and by the way, give the native people the name back, which is Haiti. Because uh, the French were calling it Santo Domingue. And so this is, this is something important for them to understand. Uh, George Washington Carver, which we know was the, uh, the no real second, no real peer at the time in terms of just agriculture, science, and, and all those things. And so they, interestingly enough, they see the word George Washington. They've had just enough school in here to know the word George Washington. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a, I have to explain it, no, this is not the one that they told you to read about. So, uh, there we have it. Uh, Julius Nerere, uh, the Tanzania, of course, one of the great leaders, also during the anti-colonial struggle. And uh, he's here for a lot of reasons, one having to do with how he organized his society uh, in terms of just getting along in communes and, and this kind of thing. And a lot of the terms that we use in Kwanzaa are Swahili terms that he actually tried to put into action in, in the way he organized his, his nation, and also support for a lot of the frontline states, uh, Mozambique, Zambia, uh, South Africa, and all the rest that he lent to them. Of course, being one of the uh, founders of the OAU. Uh, Ephraim Mamou, if you're from Ghana here, he's a, a very well-known uh, uh, um, airway man from Peki out here. Uh, what he was able to do is try to maintain the African culture in terms of their songs and their dress and their instruments and all of that in the face of this barrage of, in this case, British, uh, you know, British uh, cultural imperialism, I'm calling it. Harriet Tubman, this is when we tell them about the slave trade in the U.S. and how we got to the U.S., which, believe it or not, most of them actually don't know. And so, and I say this on almost video, almost every video, I was explaining this to them one time and I mentioned something about not being paid and then I went a little further down the wall and they were still in awe and I tried to figure out why and that's because they thought all this time we had been getting paid. So when you walk around Ghana and they think you have money in your pocket, you understand why. They thought you've been getting 400 years worth of checks every Friday. What? And it ain't exactly worked out that way. <laughs> So, I mean, we're, we're starting from zero here. And the, and the bad thing is that the curriculum really don't tell them anything. And so, and there's a lot of theories and a lot of anecdotal stuff about why that is so, and who is controlling the content of the curriculum here in Africa. But suffice it to say, whoever's controlling it, whether it's the outsiders dictating to the insiders, the insiders having internalized the outsiders' outlook, the the... the product is the same, which is, you know, very bad mm -hmm. information for the young people in Africa. Um, okay, so, what do you say? Bomani, how far do you want to go? Oh, yes, I've done to that big, big... To the big ones here. Okay. Yes, and by then, okay. I'm hoping that the lunch should be close to organized. What do we say, around 12? Yeah, it'll, be, it'll be by 12. Uh, okay, well, you we might sit up there, but well, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, Samora Michelle of Mozambique. This is also one of the frontline states. Uh, they were having to struggle against the Portuguese during the colonial times. Uh, Michelle was a, a great young uh, soldier who's a nurse, actually, by training. And um, he was kind of the protege of someone, uh, Eduardo Manlani, further down the wall. Down the wall. He was killed in a... In a airplane crash, which we're pretty sure was orchestrated uh, by the South Africans. So, another one of our young, dynamic leaders. You may see the last name, Michelle. Uh, his wife was also uh, very active in that movement and later on married to Nelson Mandela. Uh, <clears throat> Nanny of Jamaica, born in Ghana, of course, ended up in Jamaica. Uh, she was so organized, powerful, and uh, influential that her struggles against the British made them finally give her or have a treaty with her to have their own part of the island. I've never actually been to Jamaica. He's from Jamaica, but I know there's a nanny town or nanny region or something like that, which is still uh, still there. I understand it's much smaller than it was when she was uh, But the point here is these are the Maroons who ran away, and this is what I want the children to understand. We always had people that were getting out, running away, uh, going to the mountains, fighting from these uh, enclaves and these strongholds. 
and uh, she was one of the more powerful ones. Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. Um, I usually go a little bit through some of the history even of his name, uh, I mean Rastafari or, you know, Lidge, Tafari Makonan, Rastafari Makonan, and then the Gaia's name, Haile Selassie, you know, when he actually became the emperor. And a little bit about, you know, the reforms he tried to put in place and these kind of things. But really, it's very interesting, a lot of the people, Rastas, aren't really sure that this was exactly where that came from. I mean, you wouldn't, you would think they would know, but not, no, not the ones in Jamaica, you know, but a lot of ones here are just kind of like, Rasta, you know. <laughs> there was something behind that, you know. Okay, Pianchi, by now, you know, I told you, we talked about the uh, Sheikh Ante Jop and the black, uh, uh, black civilizations of ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, and we talk about Pianchi and uh, these 25th dynasty kings who were basically the last strong black dynasty uh, in the Nile Valley, Egypt, or Nile Valley, Kemet. Uh, Shaka, the Zulu king. Uh, sometimes some of the teachers will have seen the movie Shaka Zulu, you know, so it's not usually just completely uh, foreign to them. But with the children, you know, I just try to express it. You know, sometimes when you are, when one powerful leader in any place in the world is taking over different areas of, you know, his, his neighbors, uh, even though it is, of course, traumatic to the neighbor to lose their sovereignty to another, someone like Ashaka and the Zulus as they, as they expanded. But sometimes those consolidations can also make you uh, less vulnerable to outside pressures and, and people like the British and the other ones coming in. So, of course, he revolutionized the weaponry and the fighting and all that too. Some of you, you saw that in the movie. Fannie Lou Hamer, of course, this is our sister from the U.S. again. I tried not to put too many people from the U.S., but you know, we're always gonna get a little more rep if I'm running the wall, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, but the courage, you know, I talk about these attributes, you know, uh, and Stokely Carmichael, uh, Kwame Ture was talking about what she taught them about courage during those days in SNCC and the rest. And so when I explained to them how she was beaten and jailed and tortured only for trying to, you know, have the right to vote and explain to them that even when I was a child, it's very difficult to vote for black people, although on paper it was there, but in practicality, it was, it was not easy. And so a lot of the children are really uh, uh, appalled by that because, you know, they've been taught, of course, democracy, the home of democracy. How, how could that have ever happened to us? It's on the way just a couple more years. It's already hitting that way. It's, it's yeah. going to happen again, right? It's going to get crazy. Okay. So now some of these big ones, a couple of the, I got four kind of, I have eight big ones here, but four are like uh, major leaders or major figures here in historical Ghana. Togbe Sri for the Ewe people who come from the Volta region, uh, Benin, uh, Togo, and Dehir. He's the one who brought them down, especially the southerners called Anglo Ewe's, and uh, brought them from a place called Moche with a lot of adventurous stories around how they came and how they evaded uh, Akoli, the wicked king from that time and all of this. So uh, that's like props to the Ebe's. Um, Ephraim Mamu was an Ebe. Of course, um, yeah, Santa was an Ashanti. So we have different people, Northern, talk about. Ejete was a Ga. Uh, uh, Ga Mante, at the turn of last century, was a man called Taki Tawia. Uh, very influential uh, at that time, the, the Ga Mante, which is like the king of the Ga's at the time. So of course they were right there in the middle of the colonial period where they had to struggle against the British and try to maintain some level of sovereignty. And uh, he did, did what he could. Okay, now uh, I stuck these four in the middle because these are four more of my favorites, kind of like Garvey and Cole on the front. Uh, an armor or minis, uh, this one uh, also elicits a lot of talk and chatter, especially from like the, the missionary and these other ones because they've been giving these children and these, now they're all adults, <laughs> all of this literature of ancient Egypt again with somebody like, um, you know, Yul Brenner being the Pharaoh and, you know, we had to watch all of these movies, you know, uh, and all these kind of Jewish, uh, Europeanish, Arabish people doing everything from building the pyramid to carrying the blocks, you know what I mean? 
Uh, but this is many is enormous. This is actually, we know the face looks like this because the big uh, stone head is still there in the European Museum. And uh, this is the first pharaoh of the first dynasty of ancient Kemen or ancient Egypt. So I just let the children stare at that face for a while and compare it to all of the literature that they've been getting all the way since they were born, basically. And, you know, they just, most of them just saw someone look like this just this morning down at the roadside, you know, buying cocoa. So it's a, uh, it's African, it's a black thing. Uh, Cabral, of course, one of the very, very great thinkers, uh, fighters, uh, I won't say single-handedly, but probably the most influential person in, in bringing on the collapse of the Portuguese empire in Africa and the, and the Portuguese colonial era. Uh, organizes people around culture, around a lot of things to fight, systematically uh, rooting out the Portuguese. And when he got them out and they started losing, it's kind of like a Vietnam situation. Like in the U.S., after losing so many soldiers and so much blood and so much treasure, you know, the people rise up and say, you know, we got to get out of Vietnam. And so if you look at the Portuguese during the time, especially the students are saying, look, we have all of these problems and we're spilling out our blood and treasure in these African colonies and all around trying to maintain this facade. Let it go. So, of course, they revolted in 74. They had the revolution in Portugal and all of the colonies, uh, African colonies, Angola, Mozambique, uh, Guinea-Bissau and the rest uh, were freed. So, but his books, uh, Return to the Source, Unity and Struggle, and some of the other ones, really give you an idea how cultural, how culture is uh, weaponized, if you will, and will have to be used, you know, as the basis of uh, reestablishing power in the world. The great Imhotep, of course, uh, the world's first multiple genius and uh, the world's first medical doctor, and so we kind of go through that. We talk about the Hippocratic Oath and the fact that, you know, Asclepius is in there, and that's basically in the uh, So that's just one of those things that if you're a small child and you wonder if you can be a doctor, you should always remember the first people to practice medicine and to write about it and to have the theory of it. Uh, we're your own people uh, in the Nile Valley, Africa. Uh, this picture has been through some changes because uh, we had lost it once, and then the guy painted over it, and then some reacted, and then you, know, you see it's kind of straight. But anyway, Toussaint Louverture, once again, they, they do us a lot of favors by telling us so much about Napoleon and his people. So, you know, the, suffice it to say that Napoleon is not the greatest, you know, at least not in this case anyway. So um, the Haitian Revolution is a whole thing we're going to try to, you know, we try to talk to them about offline and this part of the program that we're putting together. So Saturday mornings, we can take someone like this, take the Haitian Revolution, and that'll be the whole topic for a discussion for a whole morning. So we want to do them on each one of these. We've tried it a little bit, but I you can't do it very well where we were just sitting. So I have a building I'm building down there is where I want to do it, but that's kind of been put a little bit on hold. Nagbewa in the north, one of the northern, you go to the north, he's uh, the father of a lot of the northern groups that you'll see along the way. Uh, the Moshi, the uh, Mamprusi, the Gombas, uh, the Numbas, a lot of them. So he, they all come down through his bloodline. So that's not Bewa, including uh, uh, my wife's people. We'll say Kiku. You'll learn more about him when you go to uh, learn more. Now, we had a big storm. It's been about a month now. And it just really, uh, you'll see when we go further down here, it just knocked off. Of course, a lot of this has to be repainted anyway, but it really chipped off a lot of paint in a lot of different places, especially going that way. This way it wasn't so bad, but they really got it down here. But anyway, he's the first uh, king of the Ashantis, the Ashantihini, and uh, there's a big story of him with the Compa Noche and the Golden Stool and the rest. So what do you say, Bumani? We want to stop at Malcolm. We can stop anywhere. I'm okay. Malcolm is good. I'm fine. But Malcolm is good, and then we can finish the other half. Okay, so we'll get we we'll can work it out. And then we'll see who is going to uh, re up after the uh, break. Thomas Sankara. Uh, Sankara was one of the great young, well, one of the young leaders uh, killed as a young man. 
and uh, Burkina Faso, which uh, Burkina Faso is just north of here. It used to be called Upper Volta by the French, but it's um, Burkina Faso means in the Moshi language, upright people. So he was well known for his uh, anti-corrupt uh, governance and also bringing a lot of women for the first time really into the hierarchy of the government. Uh, but the real thing, the reason he was really taken out is his defiance of these international financial institutions, World Bank, IMF, who put these onerous and uh, not just onerous but odious loans on top of folks and then asked them to starve to death. Right. And so he said, we're not going to starve and we're not paying all of this stuff. And that was going to be setting a bad example. So his, his days were numbered. But at least the brothers stood up and said, you know, this is not how we're going to continue. Uh, Amenarenus, now, once again, uh, for the, not just for the young girls, but for everybody, I like you to know about Amenarenus and the Kandakis, which were also the Candaces um, of ancient Kush. Because as, as I just mentioned with Napoleon, I think I mentioned before, the Roman army, they're forced to learn so much about these Roman armies. So when I can give them this scenario where the Roman army was going south out of Egypt, which they had taken over by then, the Romans, and going south into Kush, established their rule there, they were stopped by Menorahus and her army and pushed back into, you know, Egypt proper. Uh, after they won, the Candace, her and the other Candaces or Kandakis were able to enforce that sovereignty for some up to 300 years. So I like the young ones to know, look, we've had these kind of female leaders also who have stopped this nonsense. And now this is, of course, when the parity between the weaponry was a lot uh, more or, you know, closer. You know, as, as we fell further and further behind in terms of just basic military technology, when they, we rejoined them, then of course we had a we had a new new problem. But back in these days, we could actually defend our sovereignty with our strategy, our people, and our bravery. Uh, speaking of which, this is Menelik, uh, Ethiopia. Of course, he saw how everyone else had been colonized by the French and the British and the Red Portuguese, and the Italians wanted to do the same thing to Ethiopia. Of course, he saw it coming, so he was able to organize his people his weaponry, his ammunition, his strategy, and all of those to ensure that Ethiopia didn't become another casualty like the other one. So uh, they're really the only ones that maintain their sovereignty through actually strength of arms. You okay? We're gonna, we're gonna stop right here so you can take a break. <laughs> Brother Malcolm X, we had a little paint chip off of there. But, uh, Minister Malcolm, I mean, for us, we know a lot, a lot about him, or at least some about him. Um, but the children here, some of them would have actually heard his name. I mean, most of them will have heard Martin Luther King. That's about all. But some people have actually heard heard of Malcolm X. You know, I'm talking students now. Uh, the fascinating thing to a lot of them, of course, is the X. They want to know why, what's, why the X is there. And so I explained to them about, you know, since he didn't know his African name and he refused to take theirs, he went with X. Now the interesting thing there too, though, is um, what we do sometimes is we have a little skit. And the skit will take a, a family, like a local family. Common name is Nate here, for instance. So some of the children might be named Nate. So we'll put them together, the teachers and everyone, as a little family. And then we'll go through a scenario where they land first in, uh, in uh, say, Brazil, and one of their children, the Narte children, is sold off, and he now becomes Da Santos or something, some, Brazil, some Portuguese name. And so he, then they, the rest of them get back on the ship, and they sail a little more, and they get to one of the Spanish-speaking colony, you know, islands like a Cuba or something, and they become Gonzalez or Perez or something. That same Narte just... 25 days later, you know, and then we do it until we deplete the whole family. And one is now Macintosh because he landed off somewhere in Jamaica, and then another one, you know what I mean? And so they get the fact that, okay, so we're a family at Nate, that's it for, that, for how many generations back, and within the space of a month, you know, we're all split up on different islands with different names from different European countries. And for them, that that's 
kind of hard. And, and I and the teachers, all of them, it's it's not. You just be surprised how little of this basic information has come through over the years, you know, in the curriculum and in the media and whatnot. So I think Bumani, that might be a good place to hold it. You can never, you can never go wrong in right, cool. Malcolm. All right, so family, we will we continue and. Just in case you don't, I'm just going to walk along. So Jerry, I will see you up there for okay. lunch. I'm just going to walk through and let you just get the visual of what uh, is remaining. And this is uh, this beauty in itself. Yeah. Energies of black power. Black struggle, black organization, black nation building. If we're, if we're looking for solutions and ideology, I've had great ancestors that have laid it down. We just got to do the work. And family over here is a future library. Every time I come, it's being built up little by little. And good thing is our brother Jerry got more land. So if he wants to do a few more projects, he can get it done. So that's one of the things we talk about. Land investment, land development. Straight up Pan-African nation building. We are good to go. Mr. Bomani Dakari, what's up with you? You ready for lunch? And yes, family, lunch will be served soon and we're gonna enjoy this wonderful buffet. It's all good. And back to this tropical, uh, sweet areas. Now you have some extra land, plant up some fruit trees and things like that. Enjoy the vibes of nature and reconnecting. History, culture, relaxing, reconnecting, all that good stuff. Join the journey of a lifetime. <laughs> 